We're so happy to have you here to this. Uh, this lecture is part of a biennial Deborah Beebe Memorial Lecture um, sequence or series. I'm Tally Moses, and I'm an associate professor at the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work, and I have the pleasure of taking a lead in organizing this every couple of years. And this lecture, I want to say a few words about what this uh, scholarship is about and how um, lucky we are to, to have it. The lecture series is dedicated to the uh, memory of Deborah Beebe, a graduate student in the 1980s here at UW-Madison. Um, Debbie was a committed advocate um, and tireless advocate of individuals with serious mental illnesses. In Madison, Deborah took an, the initiative to work on major projects, finding food and shelter for the uh, city's homeless residents so they would be safe during the cold winters. While working in a group home with uh, with people with mental illness, she was tragically killed at the age of 27. Debbie's parents, Richard and Marilyn Beebe, established a scholarship in their daughter's honor in 1991. It's 32 years ago, hard to believe. This scholarship funds this lecture series and scholarships given annually to students, to graduate students in the school of social work who have a commitment to work in the air, you know, with people with a serious or uh, long-term mental illness. And, or in, and who have a good academic standing and with priority or preference given to students who are funding their own education. More than 65 scholarships have been uh, given out, granted over this 32 years. This year, two students received this award. Um, the Daniel, Danielle Gladney and Teddy Montiel, are they here? Uh, I guess they're not here. Anyway, they're wonderful, I'm sure. The Deborah, the Debbie Beebe uh, Scholarship is also made possible through donations from the De Debbie's extended family, the Beebe's neighbors, friends, employers in South Bend, Indiana, originally. Donations have also come from other charitable organizations like Goodwill in Madison and uh, other individuals in this area. We give our heartfelt thanks to the, De to the Beebe family and various others who have contributed over the years in this, in this way to help our students and to help our community indirectly. I want to, uh, before, so I'm, I'm at the end of my part, uh, I want to thank the staff at the school who helped make this event poss uh, possible, to help make it happen. In particular, I want to uh, thank um, Gerald Eggleston, our event coordinator, he's up there in the back, and I also want to especially thank Jason Lee, who is our communications manager. A couple of housekeeping notes is um, those of you who are interested in CEUs um, know to have signed either online or on the sheet, the front table over there. And then you'll be receiving an email from uh, Amy Basil, our um, field program assistant after this event. So this is the presentation part will take, you know, will last until about 6.45-ish. And then we'll have 15 or so minutes for Q&A. And so be sure to think about your questions. And around 7, we're going to have a reception. And I imagine it's going to be that way. Yes. So now I'm going to turn this over. Oh, what? That way? Oh, and there's a drink bar. Uh, there's a, yes, to lubricate one's soul. And now I'm going to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Lynette Studer, to introduce our esteemed presenters. Hi, my name is Lynette Studer, and I am fortunate enough to be a clinical associate professor at the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work. I want to shout out to my class fierce social workers graduating in seven weeks, although they don't really want me to say that because it inspires anxiety. But you're almost there. So. Um, it's my sincere pleasure to um, introduce you to our keynote speakers tonight who are amazing advocates for people with serious mental illness 
even more amazing advocates for assertive community treatment and are um, amazing friends of mine as well. Uh, first, and I'm going in alphabetical order, so don't read into it, um, is Dr. Jana Fry, who has directed the PACT program here in Madison since 1997, or as I heard this year, the late 1900s. <laughs> Literally, that's what I've heard in classes, so just date yourselves that way. Um, and has worked in various positions at PACT for over four decades. She is a licensed psychologist and as of today, continues to work at PACT, um, at clinically providing services um, to the consumers. Dr. Fry leads PACT training mod and model dissemination and has various publications on PACT's vocational and transition projects. Second is Dr. Maria Monroe DeVita, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in the University of Washington School of Medicine and is also a licensed clinical psychologist. She is the director of Washington State Center of Excellence in Early Psychosis and the co-director of Washington State's Center of Excellence in Early Psych... Did I just say that? <laughs> It's very important, so I'm going to emphasize it twice. Um, and the co-director of Supporting Psychosis Innovation Through Research, Implementation, and Training, or the Spirit Lab, at the University of Washington. So remember when I tell people to go look at the UW Spirit Lab? That's Maria. So. Um, she's an internationally renowned trainer and research, um, researcher on assertive community treatment and is the co-author of the Tool for Measurement of ACT, or Team ACT, an enhanced measure of ACT fidelity. Dr. Monroe DeVita is currently working with Dr. Lorna Mosier and myself on a landmark national study on assertive community treatment that's funded by the Arnold Ventures. And then finally, last but not least, Dr. Lorna Mosier, um, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is the director of the Institute for Best Practices and provides training, consultation, and evaluation services in support of assertive community treatment across the United States and abroad. Dr. Mosier is the co-author of the tool for the measurement of ACT, Team ACT, a contemporary measure of ACT fidelity, um, and conducts research examining the facilitators and the barriers to higher fidelity ACT implementation. She is currently leading us in the descriptive study of the status of ACT implementation across the U.S. and is hoping to see wider ACT dissemination in her home state of Wisconsin. Although, from North Carolina, she wondered if the conference would be canceled because of the snow. I told her she lost her Wisconsin card because of it. So, but without further ado, I think you're up. So please help me in welcoming you. Uh, she outed me. I haven't lived here since 2000 and two, 2000. So 23 years sucks the hardiness of knowing how to deal with this weather. And so, yeah, it's good for you because I hold you up to a high level trekking through the snow to get here. So with further ado, also, I have spent three years doing a lot of training consultation on Zoom. So somehow you have to emulate that for me. Like, give me like, yeah, high fives, hearts fly up because that's kind of how I'm used to interacting with people at this point. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Starting is laying the groundwork for what ACT, PACT, we use those interchangeably in this talk, what that is so that we have a shared understanding before we go into a little bit deeper conversation about it. So Kevin had been in the emergency room two times these past three months. Both times his mom was worried about his increasing agitation and isolation. Kevin had been enrolled in college but dropped out after missing his classes. His mental status state was deteriorating. He reported that he was getting all the knowledge I need from the two professors instructing him in his head. He started to heavily smoke cannabis, which appeared to further disorganize his thinking. At one point, he was arrested for breaking and entering. He entered a neighbor's home because he believed there to be a lecture held there that evening. Kevin was very inconsistent with taking any of his prescribed medications. The side effects were intolerable yet also his symptoms appeared poorly managed. Despite seeing a psychiatrist, a therapist, getting support from a care manager, Kevin was struggling to live on his own, have relationships with his peers. 
to get and keep employment, stay out of the hospital. With two other younger children, Kevin's mom was struggling to keep up with managing everything in her life. The care manager suggested that Kevin be evaluated for assertive community treatment, otherwise known as ACT. Kevin's fictional, but he's very familiar to a lot of us who do this kind of work. He's somebody that the system doesn't have enough for him, and that's where ACT comes along to provide intensive wraparound services to help Kevin try to get back on track and live life in the community. So who ACT is intended to serve, my colleagues here did not understand the owl picture, so I'm trying to emphasize it a little more. <laughs> It's people like Kevin who has psychosis. Um, ACT was designed with people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, especially when mania is a significant problem. But having those diagnoses does not mean you need ACT level of care. You also have indications that you're really struggling in life. So for a lot of folks, they're in and out of the hospital, they're using crisis services, they have problems that get them arrested and incarcerated. They're homeless for longer periods of time. They have struggled with keeping up with, um, well, a lot of folks engage in substance use. In part, sometimes to try to manage what's going on within them. Substance use tends to make everything worse in their life on top of it. There are folks that, you know, day to day, their adulting skills are really struggling. Self-care, managing the home, having employment, having relationships. So these are folks that it's not just them having a diagnosis of schizophrenia, it's that they're really struggling because of the symptoms and everything that surrounds having that illness. And also ACT as a model that really in the continuum of services is really the most intensive community-based service. So you'll hear sometimes the language of least restrictive alternative. And what that means is that without ACT, a lot of folks will find themselves in the hospital, incarcerated, in the group home they won't want to be in, um, and homeless. So this is to depict where ACT sits in this bigger system of care. Some folks, and this happened I think early on, much more than we see now for a variety of reasons because of how much we've shut down inpatient beds, a lot of folks came to ACT or PACT by way of these more restrictive settings. They were in a hospital for years and years on end. They were in this supervised setting, assisted living facility, not wanting to be there. They were the 28-year-old with the assisted living facility residents who were 90-year-olds. They were incarcerated, so they came to this model for this intensive wraparound services to help them succeed in the community. But then there's also folks that they're getting more lower intensity community-based services, but it's not enough, or they're not getting anything at all. And because of it's not enough, they're finding themselves in emergency situations, in crisis, and so they're coming through to the team by way of really struggling with less intensive supports. An overview of some of the key ingredients of ACT, which I want to emphasize, it's 2023. We're not coming up with anything on our own from 2010, 2000, as you're going to hear from Dr. Fry. We're reciting the key elements they came up with in the 1970s. So the model was designed to be community-based. You bring services to people where they're at. You don't expect them to come to you in some office-based setting. The team is the fixed point of responsibility. So one of the bigger problems is that services get very fragmented. And all the different people out there that who could be providing services, they're not talking to each other. So I like to think of the fixed point of responsibility idea as equivalent to Costco, Sam's Club. In the South, we have BJ's, where you can get your tires changed, new glasses, lunch, and more stuff that's ever going to fit into your pantry in one trip. So that's the concept of ACT with fixed point of responsibility. And if you're going to be the fixed point of responsibility, you have to be prepared to provide a range of services that will meet people's various needs, whether it is psychiatric symptoms, substance use, wanting a job, wanting help keeping that apartment, getting the cat, whatever it is. So to do that, you have to staff the team to have staff on the team who is capable of doing all these different things. So you build up the team to have different training, experiences, expertise, all working together. That's this transdisciplinary team approach. And you're delivering service with intention, 
you're trying to understand what do they care about, what do they want, what's getting in the way, but you're built to also be anticipatory and ready to change because their circumstances can change quickly, so the team has to be flexible. So it may be that Mary was being seen three times a week, but things are going awry for Mary and we're going to step it up and start seeing Mary daily now. They also are designed to do crisis management services. When you are serving people through ACT, you get to know them very well. And oftentimes, you're gonna know signs of decompensation quicker than other types of service providers. So we can be more responsive in a better way if we serve the role of the crisis management system as a first step. Also, a lot of folks, their symptoms don't start at nine o'clock and end by 5 p.m. So we have to be prepared to serve them at a time that makes sense for them. So it doesn't mean that you're necessarily providing scheduled services at 2 a.m., even though Lynette had a story of doing that with employment services, I remember. Yep. But most of the time, it's people who need support over the weekend. You know, weekend is a time that people can get extremely bored, and it can be the best time to help people connect to the community and find those free resources that's happening on a Saturday. To do all of this, you can't have the caseload of 20, 30, 40 people. So PACT Act was designed to have this intensive caseload that for every direct care provider, you have no more than 10 people served is typically the guideline that you're trying to stay within that allows you to provide that robust services. And then finally, they studied this early on. For this group of people, you don't have arbitrary time limits of how long you provide services. You don't say, you're authorized to serve them for one year and then they move on. For some folks, this is the least restrictive level of care for their lifetime. But there's also some folks that get better and we want them to get better to the point they no longer need this level of care and they move off to a different service too. So this is a quick snapshot of who we're talking about when we say a transdisciplinary team. So we always have a team leader who's leading the team, the psychiatric care provider, which may be a psychiatrist, nurse practitioner. They're co-leading the team in a clinical capacity too. Nursing staff, so you have a medical team within the team. Care managers, employment specialists, peer specialists, so people with lived experience. Co-occurring disorder specialists, therapists, you may have housing specialists, psych rehab specialists, family specialists. We love specialists. We want to specialize. Everybody specializes, but oftentimes you want point people who lead the way. And this is depicting what we're talking about in terms of what departments are in your act equivalent of Sam's Club. You have care management, crisis services, transportation, working with families, coordinating with the hospitals. You have treatment, so medications, therapy, co-occurring disorders services. You also are working with people that they've been burned in the system a lot and they have reason to be hesitant to trust you. So there's a lot of effort to build trust and engage and outreach, get to know what they care about. And then a big piece of this that sometimes sometimes states lose sight of, is that it's a rehabilitative model. We're there to help people develop skills, get jobs, get a friend, get a partner, get that cat. I've helped a lot of people get cats in my world. I think it was my own love of cats, but um, Mike knows. <laughs> Learn how to manage your own illness. Learn wellness skills. So rehabilitation really defines this model. So it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Jana Fry up, who's going to speak about how this wasn't created in 2010. This, this when I talk about ACT, I'm like, it was created in New York City, London. It wasn't. It's was created right here, snowy Madison, Wisconsin. All right. I think it's fitting that a, you know, a senior citizen is presenting on the history, <laughs> which I qualify as. So I'm going to talk about the history of ACT. It was in the early 70s at Mendota Mental Health Institute when Arnie Marks, Len Stein, and Mary Ann Test, who was on faculty here at the School of Social Work, later on in her career, were working at Building 2 on the Mendota grounds. 
They were being challenged by the ever revolving door of recidivism. In and out, these people came. This group balanced and believed there had to be a better way of providing services. They decided to pilot a new approach. They recognized that it seemed impossible to train patients to live in the community from the hospital. They had basically a what-if moment. What if we were to transplant to the community? With the support of Mendota leadership, they did just that. They applied for a United Way grant, they purchased three state cars, and they <clears throat> rented an old house at 515 East Washington. They initiated the alternative to hospitalization approach. They transplanted their unit from the hospital at Building 2 into the community. Actually, one staff person learned how to drive on the Mendota grounds so they could transplant out. Patients seeking admission to Mendota were offered an alternative. History was made. From a small, innovative pilot, a movement was created. This approach, developed at PACT, started here in Wisconsin, at Mendota, became what is the national model of ACT. What was learned by this process? The most significant finding was it could be done. They proved that you could deliver intensive clinical services within a mobile system of care. They became known for being a hospital without walls. This, this approach was both effective and less expensive. In 1974, their research won the prestigious Gold Award from the American Psychiatric Association. I think it's important to understand the context of what was going on in Wisconsin at that time and around the nation. During this period of time, there was advocacy across the United States for deinstitutionalization. The Wisconsin legislature was struggling to address the needs of people with severe and persistent mental illness. Wisconsin was taking the lead on developing an improved system of care. Our current legislation for our mental health services, Chapter 51, was formulated. The State Office of Mental Health developed a collaboration with PACT to disseminate what they learned in that first study. In 1979, NAMI was founded here in Wisconsin. The administrative code for CSP was developed based somewhat on ACT principles. Wisconsin became the first state in the nation to have a community treatment option as a Medicaid benefit. Winston Churchill said that Success is not final, and failure not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. PACT has always excelled at self-scrutiny. PACT's research has built on itself for 50 years. The first discovery through its, this systematic research base was that services needed to be long-term. The gains achieved in that first study were not sustained once services were withdrawn. Services needed to be long-term. Following the dissemination principles in 1978, PACT embarked on a long-term study, and this was a control study supported by NIMH. 
This is the longest prospective study following the same cohort of patients in the world. PAC's research and promulgation efforts have continued and are present today. The research has built on itself because of, per, of a persistent striving to improve services for persons with severe and persistent mental illness. PACT investigations have included a dual diagnosis study, systematic efforts to improve vocational outcomes, We've adapted ACT to assist with transition from adolescence to adulthood with a focus on transition from school to work. And an investigation in, on an independent enhancement through increasing natural supports to assist with the recovery process. PACT continues to provide contract services today for Dane County and we provide technical assistance on this model, both nationally and internationally. It started here, and I would really like to see it blossom here. Thank you. So let's see what Dr. Fry is talking about in terms of blossoming. So we have been leading a national study of ACT that's funded by Arnold Ventures. They always love it when you drop their name a few times. Arnold Ventures funded it. And what it is, it's a descriptive study to understand the status of ACT in each state, including Puerto Rico and District of Columbia. So I'll use the word states, but they're in it too. So let's take a look at some of the data that we've been collecting. So essentially, project one is where we're going out and we're surveying state mental health authorities, like Mr. Brad Munger was here in Wisconsin, and other, uh, other people who know kind of the lay of the land of what's going on in their state. We talk to providers and we gather information around how many teams, what are the size of the teams? Um, do you have access to affordable housing? Who is the Gatekeeper Accessing Act? Who has control over that access? How is Act funded and reimbursed? Uh, what is the efforts around workforce development? Are outcomes collected? Do you actually share the outcomes back to anybody? They don't. Um, is there policy and fidelity monitoring guiding practice? So we're gathering really rich information to tell the story of Act across the US. So this is depicting where there is Act. Deeper blue means you have more teams across the state. The orange states of North Dakota and Wyoming basically said we don't have any act. Um, it doesn't mean they don't have community mental health services, they just have not necessarily put it behind, they at times feel like it's not feasible. So they have not necessarily implemented act. The color doesn't stand out, but the states of Texas, California, and Nevada are ones we know have ACT, but we don't yet know how many teams, so they're still ones we're investigating. Idaho had ACT, it phased out, now they're re-implementing ACT as well. So the lighter blues is where you don't have as much ACT. Do you notice which state is lighter blue? <laughs> so from our estimate, Wisconsin may have one to four act is what is in there. We of course have the original team. We also have CSPs here in Wisconsin. And we have some CSPs who really have made an effort to try to do act. We have a grant funded team in Milwaukee that is designed to do act. So we have some specks and splatters here and there in Wisconsin. And I want to qualify this too. Just because a state says they have ACT, it doesn't mean they're necessarily following the model that well either. So this is on face value of them. We'll get to that a little bit. Overall, we can say that unknowing with Texas and California and Nevada, we have at least 947 teams serving at least 52,419 individuals. And on average, an area says that they would have about 22 teams. Some areas, again, only have one team. When they say they only have one team, like the state of Vermont, it oftentimes is because they have a grant to fund that one team. When you get a grant to fund a team, ideally you find a way to sustain it. That doesn't always happen. Then 
half of the places we surveyed, half of the states said they are planning to expand ACT as well. We asked how long ACT had been implemented in that state. A lot of states really have pride in the fact that they really feel like they were part of the early phase. They really made an effort to try to adopt and implement what was coming out of Wisconsin. And so, I'm gonna put the percentages here, but at least 50%, over 50% said 20 plus years back we go when it comes to implementing this model. Then we have another significant proportion of about 35% who said 11 to 20 years. Some are more recent adopters of trying to implement ACT in the state. We also circulated a survey for ACT team leaders across the U.S. to give us more information from their perspective. So we had 381 participants. Each of them should reflect a single team. So we had 44 U.S. states, which again includes D.C. and Puerto Rico, that was part of this, uh, the study. So we have good representation. Most all were team leaders or program managers. And we'll come back to this. Uh, about 60% said they've been in the position for no more than three years. Turnover is an issue. Um, it's been an issue and it's a growing issue in the community mental health workforce and that's coming through in this survey. But 70% said they had at least 10 years of experience working with people with serious mental illness. We try to gather some information about the size of these teams because team sizes tells a little bit of a story about what the team may look like. So a good proportion of them um, had indicated 60% that they are medium large teams. These exceedingly large teams are often when somebody's reporting out on multiple teams, but let's look at the lower ones. We have these minimal, very small teams. Now, when you have that few of people being served, either you are just in the early stages of implementation, or there may be some confusion about what the model is supposed to look like. You don't necessarily have that really dedicated, multidisciplinary team aiming to serve 50 to 100 or 100 plus people. We asked about um, the area they're serving. Sometimes there's some discussion of, can you do something like act in a little bit more of a rural area? And how, how could that catchment size look? Because we know in cities, you are capable of doing an act team. Like it's needed and you oftentimes can find the staffing. But in this case, we did have some folks who did report that they were serving smaller areas or the population was more dispersed. And then this one gets a little bit, I feel like I have to walk you through this one, but we asked about for teams that had been operating for at least three years, we wanted to know how many of your staff have been with the team for three plus years. So you have people who have been there, that continuity of staffing, longevity of the staffing. This is where we don't have that many teams. So 7% of the teams had said they have nine or more staff that have been there for at least three years. That's pretty much the PAC team, probably. <laughs> then we have 30% said no more than two staff have been there for at least three years. So their staff turnover is happening at a high rate. For a model that really depends on developing trust, rapport, that high turnover is immediately interrupting that process. Then we asked, compared to pre-pandemic year, so 2019 and before, to what extent has ACT staff hiring and retention changed during the pandemic? As you can see here, the vast majority had indicated, 66% said, it's worse. So, Staffing is critical to doing good care, what we oftentimes speak to in terms of program fidelity. So following the model as the model was intended and doing quality care does depend on the quality and retention of the staff you're bringing onto the team. And a problem that's been exacerbated the past several years has been we're entering in a pretty big community workforce crisis except for our new graduates who's gonna plug right in, right? <laughs> so, and part of this comes back to ACT in a lot of places depends highly on Medicaid funding. 
And if Medicaid funding is not set at a rate to then pay a wage that then competes with other places that's trying to hire and recruit our master social workers and everybody else, and with the service that you really need to be face to face, we can't do the hybrid telehealth, then we have to fix that. So program fidelity, I like to think of it as a recipe. Here are the ingredients that if you put them together in the right dose and quality, should get you some outcomes that are desirable or increases the odds of getting those outcomes, I like to say. They're not guaranteed. You're increasing the odds of getting good outcomes. So program of fidelity is really important for a variety of reasons. First off, it's a measure of quality. It's trying to do what we all want to do. We want more people getting jobs. We want more people having success in their own apartments and having relationships and being part of the community. We want people to not be using crisis services at a high level. Like we're striving for these important outcomes. Also, it helps because research has shown when you implement to higher fidelity, it's more cost effective. It's a good investment. Research cares about fidelity because if you are measuring fidelity, of the teams that you're studying, you have a better sense of, can I have faith that these outcomes are because of ACT versus something else? And then finally, it's a platform to then adapt from. So you can make various tweaks and changes to see if the model still works with a given population when you start with the foundation of what worked. So I'm going to briefly touch on some findings from the second part of our study, what we call Project 2, where we went around and we gathered data from 11 states that had been using the TEAM Act, the fidelity tool we referred to earlier that Maria and I are co-authors on, and try to kind of drill down a little bit to see what, what's going on in these different states when it comes to practice and fidelity. Just for a little bit on the same page on what we're talking about, the TEAM Act has 47 items grouped in these six subscales, and every item is gonna get measured across this five point anchored scale. One means you're not really doing that piece of the practice. Five means you're doing a great job with that piece of the practice. Fours are good, three is a big bucket of okay. So operations and structure is like the framing of the house. Who are you serving? Are you using a team approach? Are you using a daily team meeting to help coordinate care? Core team is getting down to team leadership in the medical team. Specialist team are your employment specialists, peer specialists, co-occurring disorder specialists. Core practices are the foundational pieces about intensity of services, frequency of contact, crisis services. And then evidence-based practices are kind of like all those rehabilitative practices we talked about, working with families, therapy, providing employment services. And then person-centered planning is really trying to target what people care most about and be strength-oriented in how we do it. So this is showing you subscales of how 216 different teams across 11 different states performed. On average, they're hitting 3.68, which isn't bad. That's not bad in terms of Team Act fidelity. But what's important to see is that oftentimes states do a better job with those operations and structure and core team. Where they start to really falter is like, how do I help people get jobs? How do I help people really succeed in keeping this apartment instead of like having them get evicted again and then the guardians threaten to put them back in the group home? It's, it's how do you do those kind of more elevated things that we all tend to care a lot about? Now, this is my final slide. Each column represents one of the states. Each state we have teams, their fidelity data. Usually it represents most or all of the fidelity data with a couple exceptions. They are coded a color based on how many supports that state is providing their teams. The supports are, are routine fidelity reviews being conducted. So the team goes through these fidelity reviews, they get feedback saying, you're doing great here, here's areas of improvement, here's some resources on how to improve. The second one is, do you have clear policy? Is somebody making it clear what's expected of you in terms of calling yourself an ACT team, staffing and performing in this state? The third one is, is, are you given ACT resources? Do you have a trainer, a coach, somebody who can come on site and actually do work with your team? If you're color coded red, it means you have none of that. If you're color coded pink, you have one of them. 
Light blue, you have two of the three resources. Dark blue means you have all three. Do you see the trend happening with fidelity? Except for that one, 3.97 threw it all off. But I will say the two resources they have are actually really robust in that state, and they're missing the policy piece. So they kind of throw off my nice curve up. But the trend line is still. The trend line, thank you, Maria. Thank you. Hey, um, Wisconsin's in here. PAC team was not one. We've never evaluated the PAC team, but we have evaluated other teams, CSP teams, other teams. Any guesses which one Wisconsin is? Come on. We got a light blue. Not the 3.97 outlier though, right? I, here's, here's the thing though. Here's the thing. Wisconsin always has potential because they have strong foundational CSP teams that just need this policy, the funding, and the resources to develop into being ACT teams. They're, it's just we haven't shown them the care and love to get there through legislative money and policy. So we can get there. I mean, we're the originators, right? Right, we're the OGs. And there's people in this state, they get good care, but they get probably even better care if we were selective in trying to groom and help develop some of the CSPs, not all of them, some of the CSPs to develop into ACT teams. So that was a, so Maria, Dr. Maria DeVita is gonna to speak to the future of ACT. And we hold a lot of hope because we know there's a lot of stakeholders who care to see this happen in the home state of PACT. Well, I have to say, first of all, I love the snow. I was just looking at the weather report in Seattle for the next seven days. Guess how many of those days is predictable for rain? Close. Eight, exactly. Yeah. Seven plus five. So this is beautiful to me. It's just gorgeous stuff. So thank you for that. My one of my kids is actually gonna ask me to like take some snow and try to figure out how to keep it cold so that I can bring it home. This has actually happened with various visits. I'll find it in the freezer. So anyway, I won't go, I won't bore you with that. But so I think what I'm gonna do is try to kind of tie together. Uh, what Dr. Moser and Dr. Fry have kind of provided to you all. And I have to say, one of the things I'm really awesome, I'm excited about for today is the fact that while Lorna and I do a lot of presentations together, we've never had an opportunity to present with Dr. Fry and to really pull in the origination of the PAC model into what we're describing today. So I think that gives us a lot more richness into what we're gonna, what we're talking about. So with that, um, in order to kind of talk about the future of ACT, we need to talk a little bit more about the research because there's been quite a bit of research that has happened since the original studies that Dr. Fry mentioned. Um, overall, ACT has been one of the most well-studied evidence-based practices for people with serious mental illness. There have been about, since the studies that um, Dr. Fry, and, and including those studies, Dr. Fry mentioned, there have been about 50 uh, clinical, empirical um, research studies, as well as some systematic reviews, other review papers, um, meta-analyses, that kind of thing. And all of them sort of say and have come to um, determine that ACT has had some level of community integration and, and improvement there, including more specifically a focus on decreased hospital use, which was actually one of the impetuses, I think, of, of developing the PAC program in the first place, more independent living and housing stability, retention and treatment, you can kind of see how that sort of, all of those different factors that Lorna laid out, how that would sort of fit nicely into kind of helping to ensure that folks were staying in services. And while it was a small number of studies, those that really focused on client and family satisfaction, they found that both found PAC to be a positive experience for them. So that's all awesome news. 
Um, the other awesome fact um, that I wanted to share is around cost effectiveness. Um, ACT is cost effective and there are a couple of different um, specifics I wanted to share related to that. One is that is if those services are targeted to the right people. And that's actually embedded in the fidelity tool if we're really targeting and focusing on those folks that you know Lorna had talked about and sort of thinking about where are people coming from and what are the kind of different elements of, of their experience that then really fits with PACT really helping those folks. It is cost effective. Typically those who have had a lot of inpatient service um, around over 50 days of inpatient service utilization in the prior year before they come to PACT and also if it's implemented with Fidelity. The other piece is, and I think this is kind of where we're trying to sort out and, and where we're going is how long do people stay in ACT? You know, obviously the service system is going to dictate that. For some it's going to be a step down to the next program. For others it may be a fall down because the next level of service is just not providing nearly the same level of supports. But one study found that cost effectiveness is greater within those first two years of admission. And so I think that's kind of a point I'll come back to when we think about sort of where are we going and what kinds of things are we going to really focus on in helping to support folks who are served by ACT services. Weaker, on the weaker end of things, we've kind of seen some weaker evidence in these particular areas. And again, I want to distinguish the original PAC studies, which had a lot of these positive, these were, many of these were positive outcomes, but for a number of studies since then, remember there's, you know, up to 50 or so of those studies that have been published since then, we've had less robust uh, findings in the areas of employment, kind of helping folks to get jobs, to stay in competitive employment, uh, improving psychosocial functioning and independent living skills, that kind of thing, social skills, um, reducing substance use, and justice system involvement. And so I'm going to come back to that in a second in terms of what do we think about kind of each of those outcomes sort of individually. But there are a few reasons for this, and I think Lorna set the stage for kind of what I'm about to say here is that, you know, for those programs that um, are act in name, and they may have all of those different specialists that Lorna mentioned earlier, like an employment specialist and a co-occurring disorder, you know, substance abuse specialist. If they're not delivering those services, so if I'm an employment specialist and I'm not actually helping people to get jobs or to stay in, you know, in competitive employment, I'm doing a lot of case management and that kind of thing, the outcomes aren't going to be there, right? And then the other piece of it is, unfortunately, in a lot of those studies, there was no index of fidelity, program fidelity, or it was a weaker tool, um, I think, you know, doesn't look into all of the different things that we look at within the TEAM Act, and so it's really hard to know, like, you know, it's not that ACT didn't, doesn't improve those particular areas I just mentioned, but if you're not implementing those particular practices, and, you know, the, those core elements, then it's kind of hard to get those targeted outcomes. And then the last area is just, you know, if programs have not been fully implemented, um, incomplete implementation, or yes, they started real strong, but then there's been a lot of program drift, maybe programs were defunded or didn't have as much funding over time, or it didn't keep pace with changing times, you're not going to see those positive outcomes in the same way. And so with that, if we look at all of those outcomes I mentioned, I think the three that really stand out to me are these these first three around focusing on training and really helping to sort of reinforce with providers to target those outcomes with specific evidence-based practices that are going to improve those areas, but also fidelity assessment that then holds them accountable to that and really measures those particular areas. The second, or I should say the fourth area, justice system involvement, I think is a little bit more complicated. I'll talk about this kind of toward the end, but there have been some adaptations to ACT, and I think that have been really positive and a great you know, direction to be going and have had some evidence base to it, and that is a forensic model that really targets and helps to bring in someone from the justice system to be involved within the ACT team to help to support them internally and in sort of coordinating and helping those folks who have repeated justice system involvement. So that's, I think, a really big piece here, and I think Again, when we look at the future, 
we really want to get to this, right? These are kind of all of those different outcomes I mentioned. We want to improve psychosocial functioning, reducing substance use, increase, increases in sustained employment, and as one client once said, a home, a job, and a date on Saturday night. Doesn't that sound nice? I mean, don't, don't we all want that? I think it's, I mean, it makes sense, right? If it's good for all of us, why wouldn't we think about it about the people that we're, we're serving, right? So let's talk a little bit more about those challenges I mentioned and kind of dive into those a little bit. There have been, you know, I, I love again that Dr. Fry could kind of share what the initial vision of, of PACT was. And over time, there's been a bit of delusion, or not delusion like a delusion, but like it's been diluted, I should say, um, across the country. And some of that is related to funding, and some of that has been related to cutting some corners, or again, we mentioned fidelity over and over. They just have you know, been packed or act in name, but not necessarily in practice. And that's a lot of what we're trying to delve into with this study, is really getting a better sense of what people really are doing and getting kind of a baseline of that. But there have been a number of misconceptions of ACT that have perpetuated that and I think contributed to some of that drift and, and again, those decreased outcomes in some areas. One is this idea of it being more of a case management model. Um, you could actually probably go home and Google assertive community treatment and in some places it will describe it as a case management model. But it's actually a platform within which many services are delivered, and case management is just one of those services. And I you know, like to go back to that the um, figure that Lorna shared earlier that had all those different services, treatment, rehabilitation, crisis and supports, those kinds of things. So <clears throat> again, if there is a focus on primarily providing direct supports, then we're not teaching people to do for themselves, we're doing for them. And so that is just going to perpetuate this idea of just more of a model. Even if I'm the employment specialist, I might just be doing a lot of case management and not actually actively helping people, you know, get jobs, developing relationships in the community with potential employers and really helping to do job coaching and follow along supports to help that particular outcome. A second area is around being a generalist versus a specialist. And I want to explain this one a little bit because I, I think it can be a little confusing because I think a lot of people sort of see it as like, and it truly is, it's like you do whatever it takes to get the job done. And so everyone on PAC does do generalist work, right? I mean, we hear stories of you're helping to move people, you're backing up their stuff potentially, moving to the next place, but you are wearing the hat all the time of a specialist. And by that, you are delivering that particular service that targets those specific outcomes that I mentioned earlier. Um, so maybe I won't pick on employment specialists, I'll talk about the co-occurring disorder specialist in this example, where their focus is on providing integrated stage-wise treatment to support folks who are using substances and at the same time they might do some grocery shopping but while grocery shopping they're integrating maybe some motivational interviewing or some harm reduction practices or maybe having a nice conversation about you know healthy living and maybe there's some discrepancy in what the person is saying that they want to eat because they want to be healthier but yet well let's talk a little bit more about that in terms of how that fits with kind of the rest of your life and what you're doing that kind of thing so really kind of focusing on this, like, this notion that everyone is not interchangeable, even though we want all the team members to be involved in some way and to know what's happening with each and every person on the team, each person is delivering services that are targeting and focusing on that person's person-centered plan to help them reach those outcomes. So again, specialization is really key. We kind of say like specialist first, general is second kind of thing within ACT. The third area is kind of in the name, right? It's assertive. But assertive has in some places, and I think the recovery movement I think has helped this, but I think in those kind of early years, this misinterpretation of if there are, people refer to the ACT team you know, they'll make sure things are done no matter what um, to help that person. I remember when I worked in community mental health in Denver and 
we were, I was a hospital liaison. I remember they'd say, well, let's refer them to the ACT team. They'll make them take their meds. And I have to ask you, Jenna, can you make somebody take their meds? <laughs> like, you're not going to be like forcing in, in this way, right? We're, we, it's very much a person-centered approach that you're using. And so ensuring that it's not coercive, right? Um, medications in one hand, money in the other kind of thing. So really ensuring that we're balancing, we're not using all of these you know, what we've often called therapeutic limit setting strategies around payeeship or, you know, having some sort of leverage, you know, maybe it's outpatient commitment, those kinds of things. That's not the first line of the order, and yet it does have a place when people's safety is a concern. But it's, the, the team is really working on motivational practices and helping to sort of get creative around how can I engage this person as a person first. Um, so that's a really big key thing too as well, I think. And then lastly, Lorna had, I think it was at the very bottom of the figure, time unlimited services. Um, and what that means is, you know, we don't have these arbitrary time limits. We're not saying that ACT is only three years or five years or two years. We're saying that people can stay and, and receive these services for as long as is necessary for them to, to need them. But what has kind of happened in after those early years of PAC development and dissemination after the original model is that some states have really sort of taken that to mean time unlimited means that they're in ACT forever versus that we're really trying to think about how do we help people with graduation and transition to those less intensive services over time. And a key to that is number one, that we're not just doing case management and supporting people, we're teaching people to do for themselves, not doing everything for them. And so that's kind of a big key to it that I think will again hopefully help with some of these data as we look at fidelity and outcomes in the future. There have been a number of implementation challenges as well. I mentioned earlier that there's been, in some places, program drift or just challenges with kind of sustaining um, ACT teams in other states. I gotta tell you, there has been a lot facing ACT providers more than ever today. Some of these are things that we never even envisioned. I'm sure, you know, Jana sees it in their original PAC team. If you were to look back and see kind of what were the presenting problems and, and, and challenges that were happening, not only within the person, but also in the greater community and within the service continuum, there has been an immense amount of change over the past many, many years since the what was it, the late 1900s? Since the late 1900s. So for one, the people we're serving are facing, you know, just really complex challenges. You know, Lorna mentioned folks who are unhoused, and there's a real housing crisis going on right now. Real challenges around that. Substance use, and substances that we, that really didn't even exist, or were not even really used in the community. Uh, we hear a lot about meth, and certainly legalization of of cannabis has certainly just made things a little more challenging that way when we think about sort of harm reduction, but also like for many people that also can exacerbate symptoms too. And so how do we deal with that? Um, and then justice system involvement. And I think some of these kind of, you know, are all inter interacting with one another. Another is, you know, I don't think you'll be surprised by this one. It's a complex model. There's a lot to be done. There's a lot of different parts and those are often moving parts. Um, and it changes over time too, because we're often innovating and adding other evidence-based practices that we know to work with this population. And so that means you kind of have to be more nimble in terms of thinking about sort of what is it, what is, what are the core competencies of the team members, and what are the different strategies that we could be using or applying within the the program. Recruitment and retention of the skilled workforce. I think this one stands for itself, and I know Lorna mentioned earlier. Act doesn't. You know, it, it's not the only program out there. I mentioned a fall down versus a step down kind of notion. We need other service out, options out there to really, in some ways, make ACT successful and to help. It's really not even about making ACT successful. It's about helping the people feel successful within and outside of ACT and really living that more integrated life within the community outside of ACT. And we can't do that without a service system that, you know, unfortunately is uh, more broken. And I think kind of to the last, you know, couple of points here, money, <laughs> funding, it's not cheap to do this work. And so we need service systems and 
legislatures and you know the federal government to really prioritize this. So some of you may be aware, of, like for early psychosis or first episode psychosis, there was a federal set aside from the federal government to say that states would use 10% of their state, their federal block grant, their federal block grant dollars within their state to develop services to focus on people with first episode psychosis uh, needs. And yet, we don't have anything like that for people with serious mental illness and thinking about ACT. Although we did recommend that when we were at that SAMHSA meeting, I recall, and we didn't quite get there. So that, that is huge. And also, how they finance it. So even if you have the same pot of money, the way that those, you know, the, the funding is either bundled or it's fee-for-service, those kinds of things, that makes a big difference too. And then lastly, many of these were issues before COVID, but it's been much, much harder. It's only exacerbated many of these issues that we were already experiencing within ACT and within community mental health more generally. So a couple of things about solutions. I know that this cartoon is a little blurry, but I hope you can kind of see the gist. And I, I love this one. It's like, you know what? Like, simple but working complex but right, right? I think we need to be thinking about the complex but right solutions because those are the more sustainable ones um, to really fix kind of how things are going within the work that we do. And I think to have ACT blossom is, is I think we all want to promote going forward. So one is, um, one of those solutions is to continue to update ACT. It's an, in, you know, it, it innovates over time. It doesn't mean that the structure changes. That structure is still the same. But as we learn more about what works in helping people who, you know, meet the admission criteria for ACT for this population, we can integrate other interventions. So other interventions that target psychosocial functioning, which is one of those areas of outcome that has not been success, um, consistently um, positive within the literature. Um, so focusing on psychiatric rehab or um, illness management and recovery or, you know, those kinds of things, skills training, social skills training targeting different kinds of psychiatric symptoms or in psychotic symptoms. So integrating something like CBT for psychosis, for example, and figuring out kind of how that is integrated across team members, but with the mental health therapist really leading that work. Um, improving cognitive impairment and, and disorganization. We were just meeting with Jana yesterday talking about, you know, in, integrating something like cognitive remediation within an ACT team. And again, with specialists kind of taking that forward, I know in, in some places they're doing that with their employment specialists to help to sort of help people get jobs. And again, within an ACT team. So this is an evidence-based practice integrated within an evidence-based practice. And this is why I say it's a platform within, uh, within which these services can be delivered. And I think a last area, though I could probably go on with more bullets here, but is around integrated care. You know, this is a population that dies around you know, 25 to 30 years earlier than their peers who don't experience a serious mental illness. And part of that has been because of some of the medications they're on, some of the ways and what the lifestyles that folks have had to live. I mean, we've really failed them in this particular area. And I think ACT is, is in a unique position to really take on more of that integrated care solution to better track kind of how are folks physical health? How are they doing? What, can, what ways can we really help them to sort of improve lifestyle and, and health outcomes in that way? And there actually have not been a lot of studies to look at health outcomes within ACT. Um, but I think it's an, a terrific place to go within the model. Another area that is, um, I think is a proposed solution, but we have to be careful, and I'll tell you a little bit about why we have to be careful, is around adaptation. So I mentioned the um, outcome related to justice system and involvement, and the act has not been consistently um, effective in that particular area. And so fact teams, these forensic act teams, have, are, I think, a, a nice way to be thinking about, okay, who, are, you know, if folks have had repeated justice system involvement to have a forensic act team where, again, they have someone within the justice system embedded within the program, and they are actually a specialist as part of the team, not outside the team. Co-occurring disorders, um, 
ACT teams. And these are, you know, some of you may know these as IDDT teams, Integrated Dual Disorder Treatment Teams. It's one of those five evidence-based practices that SAMHSA did their large study, national evidence-based practices study on several years ago. Um, but the focus is really on, like, everybody is basically doing the work of the co-occurring substance um, use disorder specialist within the team and really focusing on substance use. And, and those are the folks that they're primarily serving. Also, this housing first model, but tied to ACT. Um, there have been a number of programs related to that. And unfortunately, ACT is not a housing model. Um, but when you've got sort of the two tied together, I think there's a lot around sort of housing outcomes too and independent living outcomes that we can really be targeting there. There's been a, a big push around um, Transition Age Youth Act in many states, and Jana talked a little bit about how PACT has been doing a pilot test um, related to that here, right here in Madison. And now with some of this um, federal block grant funding from the federal government for early psychosis or first episode psychosis, some of those TAE teams are also starting to think about, okay, are these, is there a subset of who we're serving who do meet the criteria for first episode psychosis? Because the programs look very similar to one another. Um, and this last one, flexible assertive community treatment, or the other fact, has been one that um, has been implemented in some parts of the U.S., but it's been implemented more widely in some other parts of the world, including in particularly the Netherlands and in Scandinavia. And the idea there is that you have kind of a, a certain proportion of folks, about 20% of who people are serving in their program, meet the service intensity needs of ACT but 80% of who they serve don't need that level of intensity. And those people are not always the same people. So some people might you know, not need as much service intensity, while others might need more. And so, you know, but at any given time, it's about a 20, 80, um, uh, you know, what? Split. Split, thank you. I was trying to find the word. Um, and so those, those kinds of programs are coming up. I think in rural areas, it's, I think, you know, potentially an area that folks are thinking about, especially given that you only have so many providers and so many people who would meet those criteria for ACT. So those are some of um, the solutions. I think the other piece, just kind of, again, tying all of this together with what you know, Lorna said, and I think this is my second to the last slide as well, is just thinking about key ingredients for implementation and sustainment of ACT, High Fidelity Act. And so, again, you know, saying the same things over again, but having the data to back it up, adequate funding, number one, having a champion and leadership, having our state folks, we've got state folks right here, um, in our state and county folks and folks that are like really sort of waving the flag and championing, championing ACT services that then can sort of help to get some of that funding. I think many of these things tie together and they're often the ones who ensure that you've got a center of excellence or, or trainers that are you know local or you're working with national trainers who know a little about what they're doing around training and implementing and providing consultation on ACT as well as tying fidelity assessment to that and having it really provide a blueprint for ongoing quality improvement and helping imp those, those teams improve. Also, certification of programs, and I think this is an interesting one as we look at, in fact, kind of some of the data where teams have different levels of fidelity and eventually it'd be nice to tie that to outcomes, but where states are kind of a little more sort of looking at who really does meet those criteria where they can call themselves ACT. Um, is important, which also, also ties to can you build an ACT rate in your state? It's kind of a special thing to be able to build as ACT, and to do that you need to demonstrate X, Y, and Z with fidelity being a part of that. And then lastly, again, thinking about sort of the need for champions and having sort of leadership also sort of working together, having that sort of continuum of care really support everything around ACT, right? So that it's, it's really supporting the folks who are like served with an ACT in an effective way, a more effective way. Lastly, just around, um, this has been a, a paper that now was written five years ago um, when the PAC team was 45 years old and, and before they had their 50th anniversary this past year. And I think it, <clears throat> for those of you who may be familiar with implementation science, I think it's got a, a good place for kind of also where we go with ACT and better understanding more about the facilitators and barriers, and we'll be examining some of that with, within the study that we're doing. But that's also what helps us to sort of 
measure something that's changing over time and has innovation just built right in within the model itself. And so really being able to kind of leverage that in, in effectively over time I think will be key. And last but not least, why does this all matter? It ties us back to, and I do want to say a little bit about this beautiful picture here. Um, these, this was painted by PACT members, participants of the original PACT team um, last year um, to commemorate their 50th anniversary. It's just beautiful. We took a picture of it. And we're like, we need to end with this beautiful slide. I mean, this is why it all matters, right? It's, a, it's also what Pat Deegan says is, you know, the concept of recovery is rooted in the simple yet profound realization that people who have been diagnosed with mental illness are human beings, right? Or, as I said earlier, a home, a job, and a date on Saturday night. Doesn't that sound nice? It's something we should all hope for, and I think ACT is in a good place to support that. Thank you. Do you want us to? Oh, gosh. oh okay. Wow, we're right on time. Oh, good. Wow. Anybody have questions for our speakers? Thank you so much for that. Broad overview. Yes, please. Let's see if we can avoid using the mic. You know, I think sometimes we fail and trip on ourselves because we think we have to all of a sudden implement 50 teams in the next three years. Like, let's start with 15 teams in the places that are most critical. Let's look at places like Milwaukee that has 18 CSPs, I think, and try to understand where do we build up and support five of them to start being clearly strong teams that then can be a shadow site to help train others. I think sometimes we have to see this as with the implementation process that it should have staging into it to have success. But I think part of it is trying to do the needs assessment. First say, where do we most need it? And we've had the pleasure of visiting CSP in Janesville, Beloit, and there's some really strong programs. A lot of times what we're finding with the CSPs is that what's most missing is that medical team staffing that is most needed. So a team that only can have five hours of psychiatry a week they're really going to be lacking in terms of doing the model. And that's one of the most expensive parts of the model is really robustly bringing in that medical team, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess the only other thing I would add to where do you need it, and we're actually doing this in Washington State as we speak. I just had a conference call about this before I came over with our state, is also mapping on where, what is it look, what are, what is the current state of um, community mental health providers in those areas? Because I think that's a big thing too, where maybe we need an ag team in that area, but that particular mental health center has very few, I mean, we literally in Washington State have seven mental health centers that have one or two master's level clinicians in the whole center. And so to say we're gonna implement a full ag team there is, Challenging. And so how do we sort of work through some of the workforce issues as well and figuring out how to best support them? But not have that be a barrier, but I think it's an important piece of data to be thinking about. It's, it's the balance of those two things. And, yeah, and I would just say that, I mean, ACT is not for everyone. And I think that part of what our, you know, we need to, to target the people that need it the most 
but we need an array of services, and that's where we we struggle because mm -hmm. we don't have an array of services that are meeting a very variety of needs. So in our current state, while we love that the governor is called the clearest year of mental health in Wisconsin, we also have a Democratic governor and a very strong hold of Republicans that are on her, her street, right? So my question is, is the only way when we talk to um, our senators, um, we have the um, paying out the pay later attitude. Yeah. Yeah. So the cost analysis of the ACT programs uh, that are following fidelity, are there, I mean, can you point us to studies that would help in that conversation? We can, and actually we find that there's there's fewer studies that get published on this nowadays. What you find is states that are doing just what you're trying to do here, where they said, we need to make a case for this right now. We're gonna gather the data. So colleagues in Virginia did this, and we snuck it over to uh, Mr. Laffin over here, the um, head of Milwaukee County over there, if you ever and, and try to show from other states when they collected this data to show the cost savings. As you all know, the problem is, is when you get rid of a bunch of beds, we save the cost because we just scrapped the most expensive thing that was out there, which was the bed. So you're trying to show the cost savings with people. It's costly to be homeless. It's costly to be forever unemployed. So you have to try to find a way sometimes to be clever on how you show the cost savings too. Right. Well, and it's, it becomes cost benefit versus yes. cost effectiveness, which I think is, isn't necessarily the thing that a lot of people have done a lot of work on. Right. right. And another thing that we've noticed, because we've had a project with support for the past couple of years where we've been slowly doing assessments of the CSPs, that's why you guys got a red bar, but <laughs> where we're seeing like, okay, you have strengths. The CSPs have strengths. They are really good at a certain engagement. Um, they are very supportive in a lot of ways. But the thing that happens is they overlay serving people who are in group homes and assisted living type of settings for way too long. So there isn't this charge for them to necessarily help people move out of these settings, which are expensive, to get into their own apartments and something else where they find a roommate, who live in life. So I think that's another piece of expense that's being overlooked here in, this, in Wisconsin is how many CSPs are serving people who are basically in pseudo institutional settings still? Yeah, they're definitely covered. Exactly. That's expensive. That doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the housing is an industry. Yeah, so kind of housing and workforce shortage. So we're so thrilled you guys are graduating soon. Yeah. <laughs> Sign ups are going to be in the back. Yeah. I just had a question. Do you have any recommendations for us as students soon to be in the workforce? Um, <laughs> um, just like to help either advocate or help push along. Um, anything related to PACT or ACT or how to help? I think exposure is the biggest one. I think as these folks know that when you, you will either find out you love this work or it's just not for you. And when you find out you love it, you love it. And it's really something that becomes, you know, you drink the Kool-Aid and you really just, this is your love for it. Now, part of that too, <laughs> see the Kool-Aid drink is over here. Um, <laughs> And but part of that too, because I, I'm working with a lot of states and a lot of people who have kind of um, floated around different teams, it's finding a good team too. Because unfortunately sometimes I think people who are new to the workforce end up working with the team that's lacking and then they think that's what ACT is. And they don't realize like, oh, that was just not a great team. So part of it is trying to help vet and figure out who are the good teams to work with. But you know, once you're in it, we like to think that part of being an ACT staff, you naturally become an ambassador for the people served and the program itself. So you just can't shut up in all the ways you, you know, in terms of talking it up, um, right? But I also think like ambassador is the word, or yeah. champion I think I used earlier, but I was really talking about um, leaders and administrators. But I think to go back to your question, finding a way to be an ambassador, and I, I would say that not just for ACT, I would say for people with serious mental illness in particular, because I think there has been, um, there hasn't been as much attention on them because, it, you know, the first episode of psychosis is kind of the new shiny thing of 
across the country, and it's become you know, funded really well to be able to do that, and yet we have a need for ACT. Yeah. And we have a need to support people with that. So what is the, work? you know, if you love this work, then that's that's our, you know, recommendation. And go do it. And, like, we need people who are excited about this work and passionate about it to continue to, to support, you know, ACT or ACT-like programs. Um, but if it's not your thing and you're not <laughs> drinking the Kool-Aid necessarily, but you have another interest that is, like, adjacent to service provision, you know, whether it's policy name, or training or teaching, you know, again, kind of paying it forward to the next, you know, the workforce going forward. Some of you may want to go into academia and you're going to be the limits of the world and you're not your program and the chances in the world. So I think, you know, figuring out kind of where you could be an ambassador and a champion of this kind of work and supporting this really special group of folks who, um, who really need it, who really need more support. Mm -hmm. This is just kind of a, a, a few things I'd like to mention. Um, <clears throat> you use the word serious mental illness, and sometimes serious, though, is very treatable. There are some mental illnesses that have very, very high success rates in treating. And then there are some things that are, um, that all of you, I'm sure, will come through once you get into your work. Um, but I think sometimes people say, this person is mentally ill, and they don't necessarily see individuals. And I think they think because if you share the same mental illness, you are the same person. Yeah. And I also think that there is a difference. Uh, some people confuse mental illness with cognitive disability. And I don't think they listen enough to the people that have the mental illness. And I think if, I know that there's always an issue when people first start going on drugs. And some drugs have become more perfected than others. And I think if they take seriously with the people that are on the drugs and listen to what they have to say about the side effects and stuff, that people, that researchers start listening to these things and come up with uh, better ways to, um, I guess, develop a better drug or perfect a drug. And then um, the last thing I, I, I would say is I think if you listen to people, there, I think a lot of mentally ill people are really tired, and I'm not accusing any of you, but I would, because you haven't started yet. But I would say when you start out, um, I feel a lot of them might feel like they're condescending to a little bit. And I think they know how they feel. And I know that you get tired after a while because there's some manipulation going on, because people are smart. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I do think that this, this idea that um, this kind of lumping together and is, is one thing. And then the, the next thing, I'd really like to see some studies on what are the successes. In certain areas of mental illness, they say we've come a long, long way. And then in others, they say we've been at it, we've been at it. But there's like, uh, from what I understand, I didn't, so, I didn't see severe depression on here, but severe depression is one of the most treatable illnesses now. And I know even bipolar, I think people are getting, uh, uh, are getting better at it. I think the resistance sometimes is that we, at first we don't want to say stuff with drugs. And I think with other drugs that you take, your body starts accommodating stuff. But with mental uh, illness drugs, people say after maybe a month, or after two or three days, or after, I don't want to be on it because it's messing with my head. And they know that the, the problem is in their head, the problem is in their brain, you should say. And they know that. But there's a stigma attached to it, so they start feeling stuff that they might not feel. You know what I'm saying? And so I don't know if people sometimes, and you say you don't want to force people, and I don't believe in forcing people to take stuff. But I think if you explain stuff that people's bodies adapt and they accommodate drugs. And when people have been on drugs for a while and they've given it an honest chance, sometimes it works. You know what I'm saying? And I think the fear of it is, or the stigma that's attached to it, is so huge that people start feeling stuff sometimes before they do. Mm. You know, you kind of understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many reasons why people don't want to take medications. In fact, I'd encourage, I think this should be required reading in any graduate program, is Pat Deacon wrote a fantastic article about 
eight reasons why people don't, with serious mental illness don't want to take their medications. She doesn't even use the term serious mental illness. I shouldn't say that word um, related to her work. But so and Pat Deegan. Pat yeah, yeah. So oh, so Pat Deegan is, um, well, she's a psychologist now. Um, she's not a practicing psychologist, but she um, uh, is a, uh, she's not doing clinical work, I should say. Um, but she has lived experience as a person with, who um, developed schizophrenia in her teens and actually went back and worked at the same unit that she actually had been hospitalized at when she became a psychologist. But she is um, an advocate, a staunch advocate for mental health services and recovery-oriented um, services. So she's not like tied to act in this country, but we've been integrating a lot of her work. She's actually coming to our next National Act meeting in uh, April. Um, we're, I mean, we're just like feeding her stuff up because she talks about her next article. Um, there's a lot of really good reasons why people don't take their meds, and we shouldn't like fault them for it. It's actually there's a lot of important reasons. Um, and so her suggestion is listen to them, right? Like, listen to what it is that they're saying is challenging about it. And it may be stigma, and it might be as simple as that, and that's one of her reasons. But there's seven other reasons why people don't want to take their medications. And so she's developed strategies and frameworks and ways of talking with folks to help have that conversation about medications that tie to each of those eight challenges. Um, and I think, I mean, that's just like one example of her work, but I think that just a, a lot of what you just, you described, I feel like her work has really helped to inform, um, to kind of, you know, I probably should have put her, besides her quoting her in, I mean, I could have probably brought her in as a, a future innovation within that, because she has so many different ways of thinking about this that challenges our traditional ways of thinking about helping folks, um, you know, in the community. I was going to emphasize, if you are a word cloud, I just listen is the key word. Yeah. I think we have to take time to listen to people for them to explain what's working for them and what's not working for them and why is that and what can we be changing to be responsive to that. And there definitely is research to show that people can get better and can recover. Um, there's been, I think they referred to it, the, the Vermont study that showed that about a third of people fully recovered. So yeah. when we're talking about PACT, Sometimes people have tried different things and it just wasn't working, and that's why they landed in such an intensive service at that point, too. I think it's important to also engage people in what they want. And yeah. that's the nice thing about that, is it's a model, it's a platform, it's, it, you can individualize what you do for people. Mm -hmm. And so the start is what do they want to accomplish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and 95% of it, they want the same things we want. Right. So they want meaningful jobs and quality housing and good friends. Mm -hmm. And ACT is a service that can provide that and does provide that. Mm -hmm. But you have to listen to people to find out what, what it is they want to accomplish and then go in full bore ahead to help them. Good one, Tom. Tom, do you want more questions? If you want something just small, uh, I, I'm uh, Dr. James Layman. I'm a psychiatrist in the program at the UW, which actually fits in at kind of lower level of care than uh, a sort of community treatment for CSPs for severe persistent mental illness. It's that long name I have to take a breath before. <laughs> Ordinary specialty care for severe persistent mental illness, but it's actually HMO based, so it fits in. Uh, anyway, the comments about taking medications and working together with patients are actually bang on because the monthly prescribing guide says that the, the most effective antipsychotic is the one that the patient wants to take. Right. <laughs> right? It's yeah. actually good in, in literal terms. Uh, and the timing and antipsychotic actually to the relationship and to what people want to accomplish. Um, it, I mean, the medications can be symbolic of stigma, mm -hmm. but if you can replace them 
um, to be symbolic of feeling better. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, having something, a uh, medication that you take as a long acting injectable be um, symbolic of uh, something being punitive or being forced to do something, but actually it can be liberating uh, to take a medication that you don't have to think about. Mm -hmm. Um, and, to, and actually, most of the time, it has fewer side effects than the other non variations of the medication every day. Um, and when uh, we take the time to actually teach patients um, about the different effects of these medications so that they can make those observations um, and observe whether that's actually true or not for them, it may not be. It may be a different case. But if you give them, you know, if you ask them to observe whether that's true, you can the Bible. And you can come back and say, oh, actually, that was true for me. And if that was the case, then we've got someone who's going to stick to that duration. If, in fact, they, they find, yeah, the side effects weren't so bad for me while I was in. So actually taking the time to have those conversations about the effects that patients have on them in the context of the validating the relationship and were you able to accomplish your goals while you were on the vacation? Were you able to do them better? Absolutely, if it's something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot of that while I was here through um, the OD program. Mm -hmm. So it's been paying off. And we do borrow some of the things from my program, whichever we can steal and slot in, even in um, a, a beneficial So. <laughs> To end everything, we can say that self-determination and core value of social work is evidence-based, and it works, and it's um, clear that PAC has really evolved to really center it. So, it's time to go mingle and eat, and we want to thank our presenters.